Educate. This is RTP. This is RTP 180. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your house for RTP 180 for February 2021. My name is Wade Minter. I will be your MC. I have been trapped here in the frontier since quarantine started. It's very cold, and I'm only wearing a t-shirt. That's right, no pants. And I've run out of snacks about six months ago, which is really kind of taxing me. On the other hand, dropped a couple pounds, so that's good for me, I guess. But while I'm here at the Frontier, you are here at your own house, because we're doing this virtually, and we have a great topic on store, or on store? That's not a phrase, on deck for you tonight. Now, RTP 180 would like to give a big shout out to our sponsors. RTI International makes this whole thing possible. So big shout out to our friends at RTI International. Also our friends at Dual Boot Partners who are providing the stream for you to watch here tonight. So thank you both sponsors. If you'd like to be a sponsor, get in touch. We'll take your call. Now the way this works is we normally have five speakers, but tonight it's a bonus pack. We've got six speakers for you tonight. Each of those speakers will speak for approximately five minutes. At the end of five minutes, you'll hear a noise that sounds a lot like this. That's right. A dog will salivate, an angel will get its wings, and that's their signal to wrap it up because then we move into the Q&A portion. That's where you can put your questions into Zoom chat, into Facebook Live chat, into Twitter using the hashtag RTP180. You can text them to me if you have my cell phone number. Probably don't. Use any of those ways and your experts will get you your answers. Now, normally, we come to you from the Frontier, which is the area's only free co-working facility. Right now, we are operating under pandemic mode, so you probably can't come see us. But when you can, please do. It's a wonderful facility. <laughs> and we do things outside. We do food truck rodeos. We do yoga. We do bubbles, apparently. We might be doing those more, uh, more sooner. My English teacher mother is very disappointed with me right now. We might be doing those sooner than we're doing indoor events if the weather clears up. So keep a look out at the Frontier website or on Frontier social media for events that will be coming your way. I needed more coffee today. So our topic tonight is equity, how to build a more equitable society. And we have six subject matter experts in the field here to provide you their perspective on equity. And to kick things off, we have our first speaker of the evening. She's a global mental health keynote and speaker for corporate community and colleges and the founder of Your Change Provider, PLLC. Please welcome our first speaker, Jeannie Y. Chang. Thank you so much, Wade. How's your mental health since you've been stuck at the frontier for the last six months? We'll talk, we'll talk later. Not great, Bob. Not great. <laughs> Um, I'm super excited to be here to kick things off and talk about embracing cultural competence, specifically the powerful intersection of mental health and identity. What does that look like? So cultural competence is a, a framework that I created that intersects four elements that I see consistently in my work, mental health, your identity, mindfulness practice, and your resilience. Cultural competence goes beyond the traditional cultural competence. It is a state of being. It is, you can go to the next slide. It's all, it's a practice that focuses on promoting healthy emotionality. I wanted to go beyond cultural competence, which you might've heard of, because that focuses on the, the perspectives and beliefs. Mental health is about emotions. So I wanted to really focus on that. And these elements, mental health, identity, mindfulness, resilience are constant intersecting that I see all the time. And understanding cultural competence is boosting DEI practices in all sectors, corporations, community organizations, and on college campuses. And as you saw from the previous graphic, it indicates a circular causality. Nothing in mental health is linear. There's no beginning, middle, and end. Everyone, all of us, will struggle or be faced with a mental health challenge or condition. All of us. However, that does not mean we will experience in our lifetime a mental illness. I'm going to break down mental health a little bit more because I think it's misunderstood at times. The health of your mind is basically what it is, your emotional, social, and psychological well-being. Something that you think about from the minute you wake up, hey, how am I feeling today? Ooh, stressed out. Ooh, happy. 
mental health, to the minute you go to bed. Oh my gosh, what a terrible day or what a great day, mental health. And it's about how well or how well you are not balancing life stressors, life events with your own resilience. It is important always, always at every life stage, not just in a pandemic, not just in a crisis. It's about being proactive. Mental health, just like you wouldn't say, hey, your physical health is important sometimes. Your mental health, physical health, important all the time. And again, it is not mental illness. Identity. Identity intersects powerfully with mental health, right? It's about your sense of belonging, your what gives you meaning and purpose in life. And it's complex. It is a psychological attachment that you have to yourself that's multidimensional, multifaceted, rooted in your belief system, your core values, your cultural heritage, your traditions. And that's why sometimes if you're feeling a little displaced or you know don't, not feeling that lack of uh, community, like we're feeling in the pandemic, that takes a direct hit on your mental health. So this is rooted psychosocial stages of development, identity stages and crises. It does not mean you're experiencing a crisis in every life stage, but this is generally the population I work with. And I'm speaking to you and I'm assuming this is the age range you fall into, but looking at these stages, this is a glimpse of what you may be experiencing because I say to a lot of people, hey, it's normal that you may be feeling maybe you're 35 and you're like trying to figure out, hey, do I want to settle with a life partner? Do I want to find, do I want to get married? Who, who do I want to commit my life to? Your virtue there is love. And then if you are in the midlife stage, yes, there is a such thing as midlife crisis. We make fun of it, but what it really looks like is thinking about what you're doing with your life, creating that legacy and saying, hey, am I making some impact? I've been climbing the corporate ladder. Now it's time to give back. I'm a leader. Now it's time to mentor. Your virtue there is care. And then the end stage where perhaps some people retire and they're thinking, hey, what, what have I done with my life? Am I feeling fulfilled? That's a crisis there. What's the legacy I want to leave behind? How do I want to be remembered? And there you want to feel like you're passing on words of wisdom to the younger generation. And it's important to understand the midlife crisis there. But I want to point that out because that is the sandwich population. And I'm talking about this because you will be interacting with people in all these stages, right? Your family members, your work peers, and to understand yourself, hey, this is what I'm going through. This is all rooted in theory. And I've seen this to be true in my work. That said, <clears throat> There's also cultural identity. So depending on your upbringing, your cultural heritage, this can apply to racial, racial sorry, ethnic minorities, but not always. So for instance, the acculturation process, how well you have adapted, adopted to your host country. That would be here in the US if you're here, but perhaps you're in England or wherever that is, how well you have adapted to that culture is really important to your mental health. It can involve acculturative stress, but also intergenerational stress. And let me explain that because in families that I see, there is something could have happened 30 years ago, perhaps war or an event in a family, it can trickle over to current day and that can make up your cultural identity and also define you. And I, try, I point that out because again, it's, it's important to understand that direct correlation to your emotional, social and psychological well-being. So that said, last point, this is a this is very high level. There's so much more I could talk about. But it's very important to understand that identity is never final. You're constantly developing, right? You're constantly evolving, circular causality. Everything's in a circle when it comes to your emotions, your mental health. That's why I say nothing's linear. I wish it was. I wish it was easier to say, hey, here's where you'll, you'll be experiencing. Then you'll be feeling this. Then this is where you're going to be. No. So I want you to understand that and have that visual because everything's constantly causing, you know, circular causality of constantly emotion in a circle. So it's important to understand that whatever you're going through, that's what you're going through. This is a validation to understand your emotional, social, and psychological well-being. So that, my friends, very high level cultural confidence, specifically on two elements, because that's where I always start understanding mental health and your identity. This is a way to contact me, keep in touch. You can just pull out your phones, take a snapshot of the QR code, and um, yeah, reach out to me anytime. So thank you so much. I didn't hear the thank bell. Thank you, Jeannie. I Excellent. thought I'd hear the bell. Uh, you did not hear the I, I can I can ring the bell for you. Thank you. That's always fun for I me. Like I'm really done now. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions on mental health for uh, Jeannie Chang, please put those questions into Zoom chat, into Facebook chat, wherever you want. We have our first question coming in from social media. That question is, in this era of everyone being extremely online, how is it best to maintain your identity when you move between your online circles and your real life circles? That's a great question. I will say this. So because I 
your identity that's it's actually good that you're very you're being introspective right examining yourself and how you may have a different persona depending on work and personally but i think i would always go with because i'm trying to promote healthy emotionality how are you feeling meaning do you feel like you're switching too much between who you are via virtually to who you are in person maybe you're really an introvert but then you have to really um pretend to be that extrovert which i understand because it's hard being online I think if it causes any form of stress, you'll know. That's what I tell people, that depending on what you're experiencing, never doubt your emotions. We can doubt sometimes our behaviors that may come from the emotions, but what you're feeling is what you're feeling. And that's the core of understanding your well-being. So if something is causing you stress, if you feel like you're switching too much in, in different personalities, or you don't want to be doing virtual and you want to be more in person, that's okay to take that break from the virtual. It's not for everybody, right? Yes, you have to do it for work, but there is a such thing as, being online too much or Zoom burnout just because it's too much. Even while as a speaker, I have to like double my energy. So, and that's hard enough, right? And I am an extrovert. So that's what I always go back to the default of seeing how you're feeling and going with that. Your gut, by the way, if your gut's telling you something, that's your second brain. All right. Imagine trying to be an MC on Zoom. It's yeah. a weird job. <laughs> a great job. You'll probably collapse after. No, I'm kidding. A uh, question from Brianna on Facebook chat. What does virtue of care mean? Ah, okay, so that, that's a great question. So those were different virtues in the stages, right? Love, care, and wisdom, meaning your core value during that time. It doesn't mean it defines you, but in your identity stage in that age range or the crisis you're explaining, a, a crisis don't take that literally just means something you may be struggling with. Care, if you're in that stage of uh, the midlife, that might be coming out a lot. Maybe like, hey, I want to care for the younger generation or my kids, or I'm a leader in this organization. I want to take care of my employees, or I want to be a mentor. That's generally what's going on emotionally. And again, that's rooted in psychosocial stages of development, Eric Erickson. I didn't make that up, but I bring that out because I really see it come to play. So that's what it means. I want to be a mentor. Oh, look, mission accomplished. And our last question coming in from social media is, if you have seen one thing that people have been struggling with in terms of their mental health uh, over the course of the pandemic, but they might not be aware of as a struggle, what would that be? Something people need to pay attention to. Understanding stress versus burnout. I, I make a distinction. Stress, if you if you are aware that you're feeling overwhelmed, overengaged, overstimulated, that is stress. And that's most of the time where we are at. You're in burnout when you're actually the opposite, disengaged, disillusioned, cynical, and sometimes you don't know when you're in burnout. And, and burnout does not only occur at work, it could be in a life stage. For instance, I see a lot of young moms with kids at home, right? Online learning, virtual learning. Oh, that's tough. My kids are older, but I definitely empathize. So they feel like they're teachers and working moms, and I see them in burnout, and I see their faces more like, is this my life? Am I living Groundhog Day? I'm trying to validate ex that experience. It's real, and unfortunately, it's a tough time right now, but understanding those differences is important because sometimes people think they're talking about burnout, but they're really just talking about stress, which is manageable. Like you wanna manage stress to prevent burnout. All right, ladies and gentlemen, big virtual hand in the chat for the expertise of Jeannie Y. Chang. Bye. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you. All right, one speaker down, five to go, and it's time to meet our next speaker of the evening. She's the founder and executive director of A Place at the Table, the first pay-what-you-can cafe in downtown Raleigh. Please welcome to the virtual stage, Maggie Kane. Yay, thank you. So pumped to be here with y'all. Thank you for having me. So I want to introduce you to my friend Gary. Gary became my friend three years ago. He walked into A Place at the Table from his rooming house down the street. He ordered waffles sat at the community table, and we chatted for hours. Gary came back the next day, and the next, and the next, until Gary was top volunteer and waffle connoisseur in the cafe. Now, let me tell you about Fred and Ann. Next slide. Awesome, thank you. So they used to drink coffee from Starbucks down the street. So they live around the corner from the cafe and they found us on their daily stroll in mid 2018. And they never looked back. 9.30 every day, 
They walk through the door, well, pre-COVID days, but one day we will be back in the cafe and we know it. They order their two black coffees and they sit for hours reading, doing crossword puzzles and talking to folks. Last, but certainly not least, he would kill me if he knew he was the last to go. Let me tell you about my friend, Jimmy. Jimmy is such a goof. He loves style and he made sure I let you know that he did not shower before this picture and he would normally look much better. He also had not done laundry in a couple days because it was a bit too hard to get to the laundromat. So Jimmy has been in and out of housing since we've known him. He comes to get a pimento, and cheese, a pimento cheese sandwich in the cafe every day. Add onions. Whew. He's an odd one. When we don't have the pimento cheese that day, he'll find something because he really does like our food. But he really just comes to sit and talk people's ears off. A place at a table is Raleigh's Pay What You Can Cafe. Weird, we know. Our mission is community and good food for all, regardless of means. When you walk in, well, again, pre-COVID days, you see a normal cafe. You smell good bacon and cinnamon rolls. You hear fun music. Depending on whose Spotify it is that day, it's certainly not mine. You see a full menu of chef-prepared breakfast and lunch items. The menu has prices, just like any other restaurant but all our suggested prices. And some folks pay the suggested price. Some pay less because we know some weeks are just harder than others. Some pay more and pay it forward for someone else. And some pay by volunteering with us. So we all need to eat, right? And we all love to eat. If you don't, again, that's just odd. At a place at the table, we use good food, like these pictures here, as our tool towards creating community and bringing folks together. Gary, Fred and Ann, and Jimmy all come from very different worlds. They all make different incomes. They all have different family backgrounds. They have different religious beliefs. But Gary, Fred and Ann, and Jimmy need and love to eat too. So my friend Cornelius Kirk says it best. Equity means fairness and sameness, getting close enough to those who are being marginalized in any way and making sure their view of everything we are looking at is the same. At a place at the table, everything is the same for every human that walks through the door. No matter who you are or where you come from, you choose what you want. Whether it is that waffle Gary orders, black coffee that Fred and Ann love, or the pimento and cheese add onions that Jimmy is obsessed with. After you order your meal, you sit at the community table with others or on your own, whatever you're feeling that day. And just as Cornelius says, you may just in fact get close to those who may be different than you. And even better, you may become friends, all while eating waffles. Thanks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, big virtual hand for Maggie Kane. Time to get your questions in. Question from Elisa on Zoom chat. A question for you from her eight-year-old son. How can someone work at a place at the table? Yes, hey, Elisa, thanks for the question. So we have people volunteer every day for their meal um, at a place at the table. Well, pre-COVID days, but again, we will get back to that. So people walk up, they order whatever they want on the menu, and then they sit, have the meal, and then they volunteer with us. We have lots of other folks who also volunteer. They sign up online on our online webpage, and they volunteer as well. So everyone is volunteering together, um, doing dishes, running food, greeting at the door. You may get asked, if you're sitting and having a meal, you may get asked, to have a refill of your water about 10 times, um, but there's something really genuine in that. So yes, yeah, so you can sign up online, you can walk in and volunteer for your meal um, or email us. All right, next question's coming out of Zoom chat from L Cooper, which is Spanish for the Cooper. 
The question is, how has COVID changed the cafe? Oh, great question. Thank you, Cooper, or L. Cooper. Um, it's changed it a lot. We um, had to kind of really change our mission or, or actually reevaluate what our mission was. We had to close for a couple weeks. We had to reset, um, and we are doing all curbside outside. We don't know when we'll reopen, um, but we will re reopen for seating inside, but we will reopen for seating inside. And I know it's going to be in 2021. Um, but it's changed in a number of ways from doing the curbside, taking phone orders, um, to partnering with about 15 other nonprofit partners in this community to provide our, we provide these meal tokens and give tokens to people in this community who need a meal. Um, so we've been able to develop strong relationships with other nonprofits and, um, and then also just build community on the curb. Yes, it looks different, um, but it's, our food is still good and our people are even better. Excellent question from Elizabeth coming out of Facebook Live. How do you accommodate people with food allergies at a place at the table? Great question. Great question. Um, so our menu is specified online on our website as gluten-free and vegan. Our head baker is vegan. So she makes just a mean lemon olive oil cake and lots of good pastries. We have a few vegan sandwiches, vegetarian sandwiches. You can get all of our meals and sandwiches on gluten-free bread. Um, so we do try really hard. We don't, we, people have allergies, right? We don't want anyone to feel separated and have to, you know, pick something different. So we try really hard to make most menu items accessible to everyone. And so you can see that on our website at tableraleigh.org. And our last question comes to us from Zoom chat from Dr. O. Could you franchise this model? Oh, I think I need to sleep for a couple weeks first. Um, but yes, yeah, so we are part of a bigger um, network called the One World Everybody Eats Network. And so there's over 30 cafes across the country. They are all pay what you can cafes. So if you're from a different town, you may have a pay what you can cafe there. Um, they're all very different. They're not a place at the table. And so we get asked all the time for people to come or if we could go bring a place to the table somewhere. And we always say, let us work with you. It took us four years to get off the ground and to open our doors in 2018. So we want to help you with our tools, um, you open in your city. So we're happy to help. Um, but right at this second, we're not franchising a place at the table. All right, we've got actually just a little bit more time. So I'll get one more question in from Zoom chat. This one's coming to us from Dick. How many people can you serve either simultaneously or over the course of a day? Great question. Great question. Um, thank you, Dick. So right now we, we have limited our hours. We're only open five days a week for six hours a day. Um, we used to be open longer pre-COVID. We'll, again, we'll get back to that. But we serve right now um, about 150 to 200 people um, in need of a meal. So that's our kind of our sweet spot. Um, and then we have a lot more paying customers as well. Our model, and COVID has th thrown this off, but our model is that states that 60% of people pay for their meal and 40% of people volunteer for their meal or pay less. Um, so, so you can see those numbers, but typically prior to COVID, we were doing about 250 to 300 people a day. All right, ladies and gentlemen, support your local restaurant. Check out A Place at the Table, Downtown Raleigh, and give a big hand to Maggie Kane. All right, we're now moving into our third speaker of the evening. She's a clinical psychologist at RTI International who leads the RTI International Racial, Racial Justice and Transformative Research Portfolio. Please welcome Dr. Stephanie Hawkins. Thank you, and say that three times really fast, Wade. Um, so I'm delighted to be here and to speak to you about the value of centering equity. All right, I only have five minutes. Let me jump right in and share that the privileges that I and my colleagues at RTI International enjoy come with lots of responsibilities. We have a workforce of close to 6,000 employees worldwide and have implemented projects in more than 140 countries around the globe. So in terms of equity, we've seen equity, but we have really worked and seen inequities in our research. We conduct research on inequities and we really work to create opportunities for amplifying equity and justice. 
And so you cannot, absolutely cannot dismantle structural inequities from the sidelines. You have to center equity. And this requires structural change. So that was a little snapshot of a message that I sent to our president um, of RTI, Dr. Wayne Holden. And to my delight, he was completely aligned. We have a 60 year history of, ad of addressing social problems. And at RTI, we have embraced that the future is now, right now. So let's take a look at the vision that we have for the impact of our research. Since its inception over 60 years ago, RTI has been a leader in solving problems. RTI was born out of a need to resuscitate North Carolina's economy when Romeo Guest, Brandon Hodges, and Walter Harper became aware of the state's desperate need to attract new technology-based industries and created the Research Triangle Park. From there, decade after decade, RTI researchers have brought new knowledge and discoveries to the world. Every era of social progress comes on the heels of social upheaval. The 60s ushered in the Great Society and the War on Poverty, and RTI began its initial foray into quality of life research. Initiated by Governor Terry Sanford, RTI conducted interviews with over 12,500 households across North Carolina to improve the economic outcomes of low-income families. In the early 2000s, after a devastating war, RTI was heavily involved in helping Iraq recover from war and devastation by providing technical assistance and training in Iraq's 18 provinces and successfully convinced all the provinces to meet together to develop their own solutions. The 2020 Great Awakening to the social injustices plaguing Black people and other communities of color now presents RTI with new opportunities for leadership. Will we take our pledge to fight racial injustice to a new level? one that pushes us to see all of our work through a racial equity lens. Will we act with the courage and tenacity required to change the unjust status quo of systemic racism? What will be our legacy over the next decade? It's hard to believe it was only 10 years ago that we experienced the COVID-19 global pandemic and the great awakening of racial injustice across the U.S. But since that time, RTI International has emerged as a leader in racial and health equity research and policy development in the U.S. and abroad. RTI, with the guidance of their executive leadership team, led by Dr. Wayne Holden, began to apply a racial equity lens to all of their work and created more opportunities for communities to have a say in the development of policies that directly impact them. RTI has been making tremendous strides in creating equitable outcomes across many fields, including health, education, and policing. All we can say here at WRAL is RTI, keep doing the great work. So indeed, this is our future at RTI. And for organizations, particularly research organizations like RTI, a focus on racial equity and equity more broadly is critical if we're going to innovate, if we're going to be responsive to the needs of communities, and if we're gonna create science-based solutions that serve a more diverse base of practitioners, policymakers, and researchers, and importantly, to cultivate a strong workforce. So for real sustainable change, organizations can follow what we are doing at RTI, which is stepping into our power on the most pressing issues of the day. We are centering our research on racial justice and transformative research so that we can fully live up to our mission, which is to improve the human condition by turning knowledge into practice. Thank you. All right, the very informative from Dr. Hawkins. Now's the time to get your questions into Zoom chat, Facebook chat, wherever you need to go. Uh, first question coming in from social media. People seem to have some sort of innate understanding of equality, but may be unfamiliar with the concept of equity. How are they different? That is excellent, excellent question. So equality is making sure there's equal access to everything. 
But what that doesn't do is address the fact that there are historical inequities. So really making sure that every person has a fair and just access to live out their potential. That's what equity is. Equality is just giving everyone the same thing. So if you already had more access and you get the same thing as someone who hasn't had as much access excuse me, access to resources that creates equality, but it does not create equity, which is what we ultimately want to strive for. Excellent. Thank you very much for that clarifying question. A uh, question from Sarah in Zoom chat. Where do you think the priority gaps are in research today and how can RTI be a part of a global research community to meet them? Excellent question. Well, and that is exactly the direction that we are moving in. So there are many opportunities, um, but if we are to prioritize, I think one of the areas is really thinking about equitable economic development. That's clearly an area, but really starting to think about how, what are the ways in which we can amplify racial inequities in a way that we can solve those problems. So really being forward thinking about racial justice um, is one solution that we will be working toward. And so I invite folks to really keep up with us um, because what we are building at RTI and really centering equity will give us an opportunity to really expand on the work that we've been doing and really move everyone in a new direction. So thank you for that question. Question coming in from Caitlin on Facebook Live. You've talked a bit about how RTI International is approaching the subject of equity. How would you recommend other businesses start researching how they can apply a racial equity lens to their own lines of business? Excellent question. Um, you know, the, the reality is it is difficult for people who have not experienced um, how it is to be invisible. Um, and it's really difficult to convince those who've never been harmed by false narratives that really conceal structural racism to recognize how it plays out in every aspect of life. So what I would encourage is that leadership at organizations sort of take a look inward both at their privileges, but also the context that they're creating in their work streams. Um, I have to say, I'm really proud of the work RTI is doing in this space because we're a research organization. And so we're definitely centering equity with our research, but we also are addressing the ways in which we can enhance our workforce. If you recall, we've got nearly 6,000 employees worldwide. So there are lots of opportunities for us to get in alignment. And I would encourage that same process with other organizations. And then kind of a double question coming to us from Facebook Live from Rose and Brianna. They like the video that you showed. Where can people find that video? And then also, how can people keep track of your research that's being done at RTI as time moves forward? I would recommend that you follow rti.org on Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is up there. Um, RTI will absolutely be sharing information um, through our social media handles. You can visit our website. Um, and the, there was a double barrel question. What was the other question, Wade? Uh, the other part of the question was that video you showed was really interesting. Where would be people be able to find that and view it later? Yep, we'll be posting that on RTI's YouTube page. So if you can visit our website or email me, I'll make sure you have the links to that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Please, a big virtual hand for Dr. Stephanie Hawkins. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the halfway point. That means we're moving into our fourth speaker of the evening. She's a mother of two and the executive director for the Arc of the Triangle. And also, much to my uh, approval, a big Carolina Hurricanes fan. Please give it up for Jennifer Fultzgraff. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer and I'm the Executive Director for the ARC of the Triangle, as Wade said. At the ARC, we support children and adults with IDD, intellectual and developmental disabilities, to achieve their goals and dreams through our services, our community programs and events. So this is my son, Ethan, he's 17. He was diagnosed with cerebral palsy when he was seven months old. He uses a wheelchair, he cannot use his hands and is visually impaired. 
All that said, he's also a typical teenager. He has his mood swings and a very funny sense of humor. He loves the Carolina Hurricanes and listening to bands like the Beastie Boys. So when Ethan was about a year old, I was looking for resources and I called the ARC. The ARC was founded by parents like me in 1954. It's the oldest disability organization in North Carolina. In the 1950s, a child like mine would have been taken from me at birth and institutionalized for his lifetime. And actually for a lot of families, this was still happening until the 1980s. Imagine a doctor coming to you after your baby is born and basically saying, so this one's gonna to be too hard to raise. Let's just tuck him away over here and you can try again. These pioneering parents paved the way for our kids to be raised at home, taught in our schools and encouraged to be part of their community. So the person that answered the phone that day at the ARC was lovely. She was empathetic and caring. I had no idea what to ask for, what I was searching for, it was overwhelming. She offered some general information to get me pointed in the right direction to begin my journey as a special needs mom. And by the time I was done with the conversation, I'd offered to volunteer as a graphic designer. And that led me to eventually serving on the board and then eventually working for the ARC. Over the years, this job has taught me a lot. I've learned the more we get involved and the more we learn, the better it is for our community. To be honest, my involvement started out so I could better help my son, but I grew to see that I could help other families too. So in my position, I have the pleasure of talking to a lot of different people, the people that we serve, their families, and community partners like social workers and teachers. And something that comes up over and over are words like inclusion and personal choice. I often get asked what the ARC does to promote inclusion for our participants. And so this gets complicated. Inclusion is not a blanket solution to inequality. One size does not fit all. So here's a real life example. My son Ethan plays football on a team specifically for kids with IDD. So now picture in your head what a typical game of Pop Warner football for kids looks like. Now take a look at this. Now remember, Ethan has multiple disabilities and he's playing flag football and he loves it. Now, obviously he can't play Pop Warner with his typical peers. So it's important to him that there be this option through a specialized recreational program. This is inclusive for him. He's playing football with other kids. But sometimes we speak in generalities. All children with disabilities should do everything their typical peers do. Every child should wanna play Pop Warner football if that's his or her dream. If I suggest that certain kids may not play Pop Warner, your natural reaction may be to assume my reasons are somehow closed-minded, prejudiced, that I don't think all kids should be invited to play the game of football. This is where things diverge. Pop Warner football is one option, a specialized program like my son's is another. So that's why it's important that we make sure we see every person as an individual, see what his or her needs are, what his or her dreams are, let them make their own choice free of judgment. And this is where equity comes in. The opportunities that are available for people with IDD should be appropriate for their abilities and their preferences. So these images Im illustrate the difference between equality and equity. Providing individuals with equal opportunity, the same height step does not help everyone. Whereas an equitable situation offers an accommodation to allow all three individuals to watch the soccer match, regardless of their ability. Now let's take this one step further. To achieve true equity, we need to remove the barrier. Then the accommodation is not necessary. Remove the barrier, create the opportunity, regardless of ability. So at the arc of the triangle, we believe you acknowledge there is a disability. We figure out how we can create opportunities and offer the support someone needs. And we also emphasize abilities and the idea that each individual should decide for themselves what their life should look like. And if what they need to be happy to be successful doesn't exist, then someone needs to create it or remove the barriers that keep it from existing in the first place. The ARC is continually striving to do just that and I'm honored to be a part of that. Thank you very much. Wonderful story there. Big hand for Jennifer Falsgraf. Now it's time for your questions. Get your questions in on equity, equality, ARC of the Triangle. You can bring those into social media. You can bring them into Zoom chat and you can also bring them into Facebook Live. So first question is coming in, Jennifer, from social media. It's a question of, as people with disabilities are more integrated into everyday life, unlike they were in the 50s through the 80s, what is one thing that if someone could do to make the people around them feel more included, you would recommend that they do? Yeah, so it's funny. I was just having this conversation with somebody not that long ago. Um, 
we have a tendency um, when we talk to and about people with disabilities to use words like special and exceptional. The reality is the adults that I talk to that have IDD want to be treated like everyone else. They don't want to be treated as special and exceptional. The, the football player that gets on the news because he goes to the prom with a young lady with Down syndrome, that shouldn't be a news story. If he wants to go to the prom with her, they should just go to the prom. The fact that she has a disability shouldn't be some badge of honor for the person without the disability. And so it's really just about creating normalcy and that will bring that equity. It's a question coming in from Facebook Live from Anne. How have the ARCS services changed during the pandemic and will any of these changes become permanent? So that, that's been a, a, the last six months, we began developing what we're calling ARC Triangle University and it's online classes, some educational exercise and movement. Um, we have arts, music, so that our folks can stay engaged. A lot of the people that we serve live in group homes and so they're not allowed to leave their home. A lot of folks with disability have medical conditions that they're not out in the community. And this way, there's that social engagement, educational engagement from the safety of your home. And we're hoping that when all of this is gone, we wanna bring Arc Triangle University live. Um, I'm already trying to think about finding space that we would be able to offer our gentle yoga class in person rather than through Zoom. And so our other services, our Medicaid services, our supported employment, they're continuing on, some limits, some not so much. But we found this way to engage people outside of our normal base of participants um, and really engage anyone in the community that wants to stay connected during all of this. Question coming in from Mejica in Facebook Live. Are there volunteer opportunities available at the ARC as you got started? And if so, how can one volunteer? Yeah, so they're definitely more limited now with COVID. Some of our ARC Triangle University instructors are volunteers. Um, the exercise instructors are volunteers. I believe one of our music um, instructors is a volunteer. So if, if someone's interested in teaching a class online to teens and adults with IDD, we can certainly talk about that. Once we're back live in person, we have community events, party and picks with Santa, um, a holiday party for adults. We partner with Marbles to put on family fun night. There are many more opportunities for both groups and individuals. If you visit our website, there's a button right on the homepage that says volunteer and you can click that and fill out a short form and our community programs director, Michelle, would get back in touch with you. All right, last question coming in from social media. As you look back on your long tenure at the ARC and the journey that you've had with your child, can you point to any one event that really kind of brings home the contribution that you've been able to make? Hmm, I don't know. I, I mean, honestly, being invited to something like this is a huge honor that my journey with my son um, is a story that that people want to hear and if that can help the arc of the triangle and the hundreds of other people that we support then i feel like i'm doing what i need to be doing every day and i can't imagine doing anything else at this time all right one last question sliding in just under the wire from jerry in zoom chat is the arc tied into the business community at rtp to help connect individuals with idd to potential jobs in the triangle so we have a couple partnerships with a couple companies. Um, we're always looking for more. Our supported employment department, we still live in a world where that thinking is a little bit more narrow-minded, the stereotypical greeter at Walmart working in a grocery store. We have folks that want to work in the IT industry. We have folks that want to work in hotel, restaurant um, environments outside of fast food restaurants. So if anyone, runs a business, owns a business, works at a company that is interested in talking about employing people with IDD, definitely visit our website. Our supported employment director, Susan Swearingen, will be more than happy to have a conversation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, she's making a big difference here in the triangle. Big hand for Jennifer Falsgraf. Thank you. Go Canes. All right, our fifth speaker of the evening. She's an assistant professor of educational leadership at UNC Chapel Hill studying how to close racialized achievement gaps in schools. Please welcome Dr. Constance A. Lindsay. Awesome. 
Thanks so much for the invite. I'm super excited to be here this evening to talk about why having a diverse teacher workforce is important for students of color. So first, let's start off by talking why we need diverse teachers. There's a growing body of evidence that shows that having a same race teacher um, for black students and other students of color leads to a host of positive outcomes for students. Uh, the early work uh, in this literature focuses on things like test scores uh, using both data from Tennessee and Florida. Uh, more recently, my colleague Cassie Hart and I have a paper that looks at uh, uh, discipline and exclusionary discipline in particular. So for black students in North Carolina, I use North Carolina data. We basically show that having a same race teacher leads to reduced rates of things like exclusionary discipline, um, it, like in school suspension, out of school suspension and being referred to the principal's office. So you think about the ways in which students enter uh, what's called the school to prison pipeline. More recently, my colleagues um, and myself have published a paper that looks at the long run outcomes of having a same race teacher. And we find that for black kids in Tennessee and in North Carolina, having a black teacher early on leads to um, positive uh, outcomes such as reduced high school dropout and then also being more likely to say you're going to attend college to sit for a college entrance exam and to enroll in college and so that work has gotten um, a lot of attention. People are super interested in it and sort of everybody's thinking about what does this mean and um, how can we affect this in our local community? So let's take a look at what this means uh, nationally. What does this look like? There's this off-site statistic that 80% of the teacher workforce is white. And so here we basically show that. And so the way you can read this chart is think about the difference between the blue bars and the yellow bars as representation gaps. And so what you see is that white teachers are overrepresented when it comes to white students and black and Latinx teachers are underrepresented when it comes to black and Latinx students. And so we're in a situation where in the relatively near future, the majority of our public school student body will be students of color. And so we have this huge mismatch between who's teaching them um, and who, who the kids are. And sort of this combined with the research means that we need to focus some attention on creating a high quality teacher workforce. Uh, so let's talk about what's happening in North Carolina. So North Carolina uh, is, is similar to most places in that the teacher workforce is about 20% teachers of color um, and the public school student body is about 42% students of color, right? And of course, this is gonna vary depending on where you are in the state. Um, the other thing sort of to think about here is you might be in a situation where, you know, you're in a place where you get you get the exposure to a lot of black teachers or a lot of teachers of color. You might find yourself in a place where you never see a teacher of color. Um, one of the things that I found striking when I was working on the two studies that we have that use North Carolina data is that of all of the students who were in grades three through eight in sort of the mid 2000s, who we can now look and see if they you know, went to college, attended high school, um, of the black students, half of them never had a black teacher the entire time they were in school. Here, I'll also mention that um, in both cases, or in particular, the long run study, we found that the results were driven by persistently low income young black men. And so those are boys who are on free and reduced price lunch the entire time they're in elementary school. And we find these outsized impacts, right? Um, Unfortunately, this is a group where they're, they're more likely to drop out of high school. And we find that having that exposure to a black teacher early on reduces that high school dropout rate. And so we wanna start thinking about what can we actually do to, to solve some of these issues. So thinking about what to do. Um, so first, my colleagues and I have a book where we sort of detail um, some, some of the things, but you'll be excited to know that um, here in North Carolina, Governor Cooper, um, citing our research, actually signed an executive order where he's committed to diversifying the teacher workforce. Um, and he's approaching that in a number of ways. What's really nice about North Carolina is that many of the studies that explore this particular issue actually use local North Carolina data, right? So we don't have an excuse. We can't say that's happening somewhere else. We have the info that we need. Um, there's lots of work to do at the federal, state, and local levels. 
locally. You can check in with your school district and to see how they're working on getting this diverse, high quality workforce. Um, you can also think about supporting organizations that are doing racial equity work in education, such as Creed NC, and then Profound Gentlemen, which is an organization based out of Charlotte, which supports um, men of color in terms of staying in the classroom and giving them a safe space. So I'll conclude by saying that there's lots of interest sort of around this topic. We're at a perfect time as we're dealing sort of with how we reimagine public education, both sort of dealing with these twin pandemics around sort of racial equity and justice and also COVID-19. In a lot of ways, the way we organized and did school was not working and we have a tremendous opportunity to move forward and to create the high quality teacher, teacher sorry, the high quality diverse teacher workforce that we'd like to have moving forward. And with that, I'll take questions. Excellent. Great research going on there about racial inequity in schools, a topic that many of us parents care very deeply about. Uh, questions coming in from Zoom chat. There's several that are kind of around the same theme from uh, Andrea and Kristen and Dr. O and even myself. Thinking back on our school careers, it was rare for us to have any black teachers or teachers of color. Is it important as well for white students to be exposed yeah. to yeah. Uh, black teachers and teachers of color in as you know, even though the racial gap is primarily around black students. Yes, yes, that's a great question. And so I think that's super important, right? Uh, particularly given our current democratic moment, right? It's, it's great for all kids to have all types of teachers, right? And to be exposed to different types of teachers. Um, and I think sort of the learning can move in both directions. I think the other sort of critical piece here too is that we sort of have to think about this both in terms of short-term and long-term. So right now we do have a teacher workforce that is prim primarily white, right? And so we need to sort of move to training those teachers to be able to work with students from diverse backgrounds as we're simultaneously working to diversify the workforce. So that is a great question. It's good for everybody. All right, another question coming in from Zoom chat, kind of following along that from Rainita, is the lack of representation more of a pipeline issue or is it more about retaining teachers of color over the longer term? Excellent question. So it's both, right? So if you think about sort of the, the arc of a teacher's career, so at all stages sort of along that arc, um, teachers of color are disadvantaged, right? At its heart, this is a college access issue. You need to have a BA to be a teacher, and we just don't have the diverse numbers of college grads uh, that we want, right? And so if we're all sort of working to close some of these racialized achievement gaps, that will expand the pipeline for us to sort of bring some more um, folks of color into the classroom. But even once they get there, there's lots of reasons why um, teachers of color might turn over faster or exit the profession faster. And so we also sort of have to pay attention to those latter stages as well. Well, so that's a great question. It's sort of an all, all around the circle issue. All right, question coming in from L. Cooper. Do you find that recruitment of uh, black and teachers of color is limited due to potential earnings for teachers? Is that frightening people away? Yes, that's an excellent question. And so what I like to say is that the teaching profession sort of writ large, so not just thinking about this diversity piece, um, is under a lot of challenges. We definitely need to pay teachers more. We need to sort of think about how we respect teachers. We need to think about uh, the professionalization of, um, of teachers and sort of you know where they stand. And so the teacher diversity piece is but one spoke of the umbrella with a number of things, right? It would be hard, we would be hard pressed to, to get more folks in the classroom without addressing things like pay. So that, that's an excellent question. Question coming in Zoom chat from Carolyn. How can we change the public's perspective and ensure that they understand that teachers of color are just as competent as white teachers because of that lack of representation, their stereotypes mm -hmm. and, and misinformation around there? What's the best way to combat that? That's a great question. Um, so it's a false dichotomy, right? This 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 idea that quality does not equal diversity, and that's just not limited to to teachers. And so so one, we have the research now that shows that um, teachers of color have a positive impact for students of color, sort of holding quality equal, right? So uh, in all of these studies that we do, it's sort of a given that um, quality is sort of held constant, right? So the quality is there. We just need to expand our definition of what quality means, right? So generally, we use it to to refer to growth on test scores. So it's that, but it also is the cultural competence that people bring to the classroom. And that's just as important as being able to sort of grow someone's um, uh, 
achievement, uh, as it were. But yes, that's a false dichotomy. And one of the things that my colleagues and I are trying to sort of change in the sort of broader ecosphere is this idea that diversity is different than quality. It's, it's a part of it. It's important. We should be working on that and training people to have cultural competence the same way that we train them to boost test scores. Great question. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your research. Give a big hand to Dr. Constance A. Lindsay. Hey, thanks so much. And last but certainly not least, he's our final speaker of the evening. He's a Broughton grad, the founder and CEO of Hashtag Black Dollar NC and the Black Friday Market. Please welcome Johnny Hackett Jr. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Uh, no presentation today. I wrote something. Uh, got to start them over five minutes. So I'll be reading. Um, titled, The Quality of Being Fair and Impartial. Uh, equity is defined as the quality of being fair and impartial. In preparation for this event, I started by simply trying to understand the word equity, its meaning, the quality of being fair and impartial. And impartial. Equity has this as a core definition and it has a secondary description around ownership too. I'll come back to that later, but I really dug into this quality thing uh, as it relates to equity, fair, impartial, I do not believe that we can have true equity. <laughs> I hope to give us some hope by the end of this, but someone or something or some place, it will have to change my mind because right now I think it's impossible. Uh, this newfound belief comes from experiences and our current state of affairs that reveal that we are incapable of being impartial. And when I say we, I mean all of us. We are also guilty of only playing fair when we are publicly called on to do so because of unfair treatment or behavior or poor practices. Fairness is always a place that we'd like to get to. We never seem to move there. Uh, there are many polarizing issues we're living through right now, social, health, political, daily cancer culture topics. In these areas, at the very least, we have to decide what side of the conversation or stance or belief we're on. Uh, but when we do that, we almost certainly lose part of our ability to remain impartial. You cannot practice impartiality if you're unable to accept other perceptions of viewpoints not only to understand them, but to accept them as fact from someone else. If you cannot do this, you cannot be impartial to someone or something uh, that is opposite to your viewpoints. <laughs> Call it bad timing or dumb luck, but as I was preparing for this, it was right in the middle of the second impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. I can't tell you I watched it other than to say that I wanted to stay informed and be knowledgeable about what was playing out on the national scale. I need to know what's going on at that level. And maybe I already knew what to expect, but the only question I kept asking myself is whether or not I believe the individuals responsible for making that decision were remaining impartial. Didn't matter if it was a yay or a nay, just tell me it came from an impartial place based on knowledge that I know is probably above me. Uh, do I believe their votes or the result of the trial came from an imp impartial place? I don't know. And I'm not necessarily looking to answer that, but to switch to another subject dealing with the same group. Again, right as I'm preparing for this, I read a story about how a group of senators are threatening to reduce funding from schools that teach any information related to the 1619 Project, which is a nationally recognized curriculum composed of interviews, essays, artworks, and other content that depict and tell the story of America's role in slavery. So to circle back, a group of senators have gone on record as saying that they are trying to introduce bills that will cut funding from schools if they teach students about America's history with slavery. Now, back to this equity definition. There are surely other words that can also be used to describe the quality of being fair and impartial. Accountability, self-evaluation, humility. You can't be impartial or fair if you are unable to say that you made a mistake or unable to take responsibility of a failure or acknowledge a wrongdoing. Do I believe the proposed bills or laws to withhold funding from schools that teach about slavery are fair or impartial? Once again, I don't know. Um, and people hate discussing politics, so much so that we've created rules against it. It's taboo. Don't discuss politics at the workplace. But how can you sit there and have a real conversation about equity without talking about governing laws or people who make them? But I'll leave the political spectrum alone in favor of another, the current state of small business. It is no secret the struggle is real right now for many small business owners in America. COVID-19 has provided its own set of hardships to a demographic of individuals that have already had uphill battles in the world of entrepreneurship. And keeping your doors open during a period of time of mask wearing and social distancing is undoubtedly difficult. I hate that. Uh, and personally, I can't handle it when people die. Death was one of my hardest lessons as a child and still tough for me as an adult. Doesn't matter the reason, 
natural causes, health-related problems, senseless violence, police brutality, war. The very thought of someone else losing someone close to them is tough for me. So it's been tough trying to speak on the needs of small business owners during the time where there's an elevated health risk. It's been tough being a small business owner. Financial agendas aside, even making decisions on how to move forward or keep going is tricky. If a business owner pivots too much one way, the active way or the keep going way, uh, they may appear, a sense, appear insensitive to the current health concerns. They get pushed back or maybe they simply don't get it. I've been there myself and me personally, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to handle that perception and bridge the gap. When I first had discussions, real discussions about why I believe black lives do in, in fact matter and that I hate seeing unarmed African-American men, women and children die at the hands of law, law enforcement, I was viewed very one-sided, perceived by some as only caring about Black lives and no one else's, as if I'm somehow omitting the lives of white Americans, Latin Americans, Asian Americans, anything, furthest thing from the truth. We called out Black lives because it was blatant, had been historic, and now caught more on film. Losing a business is nowhere near the same scale as losing a life, but a business owner will pour their life into their business. I guess I'm talking about small businesses now because I see a lot of them dying. Does a bar owner believe that we've been fair to them? considering their state, what their state would be if only they sold sandwiches. <laughs> um, do we believe we've been impartial to that? Group? I sound like a conservative right now. It's crazy, but questions like this drive me. I don't have the answers to a lot of these, and it's rather di a rather difficult position to be in if you're the one tasked to come up with some of those answers or responses. A lot of stuff I'm talking about is on the national stage, and I could go on and on about this equity thing, but yes, I do believe it will be tough. I think what we can do is always try, I told you there was some hope. I think what we can do is always try to define who. If you wanna get involved with agendas around building equity and you're tasked with tangibly implementing stuff that can be described as having the quality of being fair and impartial, know who you're doing it for. Is it black people, people with disabilities, business owners, poor people, learn, meet, spend time with those personas because you need access to those other perspectives and viewpoints to begin to think fairly for a bunch of people that you're gonna make decisions for. Don't ever immediately dismiss opposing viewpoints. And lastly, let's just knock this out in small chunks. I do have a fear about being able to achieve true equity, but maybe that is on the wide scale. Raleigh is different. Durham is different. Chapel Hill, Charlotte. The best chance we have is to take it upon ourselves to show others what true equity looks like. And I think we've been doing that here. We'll continue to because we can always get better. We're not there yet, but it will be on us as leaders to make that change. The business leaders, the policymakers, the ones who don't like talking about, the ones with influence. We're the ones that will have to do equity and we'll have to make equity a reality through our personal and organizational leadership. But hey, if these, if believing in, if, if believing in and displaying these traits of fairness and impartial are too much to ask when it comes to equity, then try to accomplish it through the secondary definition and just give ownership away to those less fortunate. The end. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your wisdom there, Johnny Hackett Jr. Time to get your questions in. Zoom chat, Facebook chat. We've had a lot to think about there. Uh, first question coming in, Johnny, from social media is, as a subject matter expert in Black-owned business, what is some of the creativity that you've seen coming out of the Black business community in COVID that people need to be aware of? Uh, creativity? Um, you see a lot of you know, with our store now, we have about 90 business owners, a uh, majority of them are African-American. And you see just so many different types of products where you, you, we're able to really call the store a department store um, from having, you know, um, toiletry products, toilet tissues, uh, batteries, um, literally everything like furniture. Uh, and you just see people developing and stepping outside of their own and just coming up with so many cool products and putting a lot into their products from a marketing standpoint. So it's not really one thing um, I can say because there's just so many, many great things that people are doing right now. All right, next question coming in from social media. For people who may want to be equitable and may want to support equality, but because of the culture we live in, don't know where to start, what are some good resources for people to be able to provide that equity? Yeah, I, I normally tell people to start with causes that they care about, you know, think about what's coming through your front door. Um, you know, again, back to the perception thing, everybody's going to, gonna, you know, be more involved in things that matter to them that may impact their lives, their family, their friends. 
Um, so I think if you can start with some personal examples about things around you, you see that you want to improve or you want to help with, I think that is a good place to start because then you'll know what organizations to reach out to, what people to reach out to, to get involved in those areas. All right. Question coming in from Dr. O in Zoom chat. Do you see a lot of regional variation in terms of equity from Durham to Raleigh to Hillsborough to Apex all around the region? Is it fairly constant or do you see a lot of differences the way different localities approach it? Man, I have to be honest, man. I'm really getting to the point where I'm, you know, really trying to study equity. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of, it's been all kind of words the last year or two, you know, inclusiveness, diversity, um, just all kinds of stuff, right? I just got to the equity one. And I think that's why my, my, you know, the stuff I said today was, you know, really coming from a place of me sitting down and trying to evaluate it, really trying to understand what it is. Um, so I, I'm not going to be able to answer that question because I'm, I'm, you know, just so fresh and trying to really understand it myself. All right. And last question coming in from Zoom chat. You mentioned the 1619 project. You mentioned how it's become kind of a political football and everyone's kind of using it for their own ends. For people who've only heard words about the 1619 project, but don't understand what it is, why should they go check it out? Well, once again, I mean, if, if you know, you want to learn uh, and see in-depth uh, information about um, America's history, we can describe it that way because, you know, again, I think that's a true thing. Um, if you want to learn about history, about your own, whether it's America's history or your own history, um, you know, it's something you want to you want to study. Uh, and again, you want to step in front of it and acknowledge it and just, you know, it's all right, man, it's OK. It was a long time ago. I don't think any of us. Yeah, the effects are here, but none of us, you know, we're alive during those times. So, I don't, you know, um, just want folks to, you know, be able to step through that door and kind of, you know, start looking at that information and seeing it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, big hand for Johnny Hackett Jr. Thank you, sir. And also, we found out on Facebook chat that Johnny's a part of OurStoriesOnRace.org. So check that website out, OurStoriesOnRace.org. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes RTP 180 for February 2021. Yes, we are in 2021. Our subject was equity. We thank you very much for being here. Next month... We have the RTP Women in Leadership event. Tickets are live on Eventbrite. The Research Triangle Foundation is celebrating International Women's Day with a virtual panel discussion which brings together prominent women leaders from across the Triangle region to share their experiences, perspectives, insights of the workplace. Speakers will explore their proudest moments, what it means to work in the Triangle, the challenges of COVID-19, including forging connections and relationship while not in person, and succeeding in your career in a virtual format. Check that out, the RTP Women in Leadership Virtual Summit on March 8th. And next month, UX User Experience. We'll be tackling everything from affordances to accessibility. Uh, I will not be there because the Canes have a game, but you will be in good hands with Andrea Griffith Cash, the lovely and talented firebrand that she is. So tune in third Thursday, that would be March 18th at 6 p.m. for the live stream RTP 180 March. The subject is UX. On behalf of our sponsors, RTI International and our streaming sponsor, Dual Boot Partners, I have been your MC Wade Mentor, thanking you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Stay safe, wear a mask, get your vaccine, and we'll all be back together real soon. Good night, everybody.